The, the topic that I'd like to talk about is Arizona sustainability and what it is that Arizona needs to do to have a successful, sustainable economic strategy, and that includes a variety of topics. Uh, the topic of sustainability is overdue as a theme of long-term governmental policy, particularly at the state level. What I'd like to do is I'd like to start with sort of broad brush Arizona history. Arizona history 1.0 was about extraction. We extracted from under the soil, minerals, copper, silver, etc. Then we extracted from the soil uh, forestry, agriculture, cattle. Arizona 2.0 was about growth. Uh, which really, in a sense, is another form of extraction. It's extracting from the sun and lifestyle that, uh, that we're blessed with. But these are growth paradigms that are inherently not sustainable. So the question of our time is, what is Arizona 3.0 in a new global economy? How do we grow in the 21st century? What are the components, the fuel, if you will, of a sustainable future for Arizona? Let me submit briefly six or seven. Number one, land. Our land use policy, and specifically the use of state trust lands, which are provided for in the Arizona Constitution, give us extraordinary tools to manage growth corridors and policy architecture that can uh, incent things like adaptive reuse. But we currently have in our Arizona Constitution a requirement that state trust lands go to the highest value, which is defined monetarily. One of the conversations that Arizona needs to have is whether or not the Constitution should be amended to recognize that sometimes open space is the most successful and appropriate use for state trust lands. That's a tool that we should explore. Secondly, water. An insufficient clean water supply for long-term growth is a time bomb. And seemingly, if you think about Arizona history, every generation of Arizonans have, has had their water crisis. The early farmers faced it by the creation of the Salt River Project. Uh, our modern predecessors addressed it with the Central Arizona Project in the 1980s. Uh, many of you and I was a part of the Groundwater Management Act but we now recognize that it is the crisis is coming back again. The water draws continue to exceed recharge in many start, uh, parts of Arizona. The political cost of the Central Arizona Project in order to get the California votes necessary to pass the Central Arizona Project requires that Arizona take the first hit in shortage years. This is the combination of insufficient water recharge and the Central Arizona Project is a slow fuse to a major issue that requires our attention. Number three, renewable energy. Most of the world and most states are exploring ways to diversify their energy portfolio and make more aggressive transitions to the renewable energy. I give you many examples. Montana's clean energy plan uh, is very aggressive. It uses the entire toolbox uh, to move energy, uh, renewable energy forward in Montana. Many states have renewable standards that will hit 20% by 2020. Iowa currently gets 20% of its power from wind. Michigan's renewable energy goal is 35% by 2035. Oregon has a state uh, sustainability plan and a board that promotes it. And these are states that are led by both political parties. They said it's not a partisan point. That is just what's going on in the marketplace. And here at home, and here we sit at Skysong, ASU has created the world-renowned Institute on Sustainability. It is leading the way in areas such as new photovoltaics, the potential is algae, is a very exciting new biofuel, and as we know, at long last, Arizona is now in the private market, uh, beginning to really take its place uh, as a solar state. But we have sending inconsistent signals, policy signals, uh, as to whether or not we are advancing or retreating. And I believe that the state must lead the way to send consistent signals that it would be a mistake to retreat from a long-term renewable strategy. State government can, much like the universities have done, which I help lead on the Board of Regents, using widespread use of renewable energy, white roofing, retrofitting parking lots with solar, and a variety of other things which the public sector can use to lead the way forward. Number four, I'd like to address transportation. America has 4% of the world's population and uses 25% of the world's oil. We know these statistics, we've been living with them for a long time. We import two-thirds of what we use to the tune of over a billion dollars a day, most of which is sent to countries that, frankly, are not American allies. So think about where we are with our use of foreign oil. We are mortgaging our kids' future by borrowing money from China to finance wars in the Middle East and fund petrodictators in South America so that we can further foul our climate and put in and threaten man's existence on the planet. Are we nuts? 
70% of the world's oil consumption is dedicated to the transportation, and that's where we must start. American natural gas burns 30% cheaper than uh, gas. It is less than half the cost. And domestic natural gas re reserves are plentiful, as we've now discovered across the United States due to the new uh, tools of hydraulic uh, fract fracturing. It is cheap, it is clean, and it's American. Natural gas addresses many of the immediate transportation needs because engine technology is already advanced and plentiful. There are already 200 million vehicles on the road, of which 8 million are heavy-duty trucks. And the heavy-duty trucks consume a fifth of the entire fuel of the United States because they have low mileage standards because they're on the road all, all day long. Two small steps make a huge difference in these important, important numbers. First, we convert heavy-duty trucks to natural gas, and there is now a network of natural gas refueling, CNG and LNG across the United States to make this possible. And two Arizonans, Kevin Knight at Knight Transportation and Jerry Noise at Swift, are leading the way in doing so. And secondly, Arizona can join a 17-state effort to convert public fleets that fuel centrally uh, to propane or natural gas. Taken together, those two steps will slash our oil import by 25%, equal to that which we get from Saudi Arabia. We would clean our air, it would be cheaper, and it's American. Number five, sustainability in education. I would submit that growing and keeping talent is a sustainability issue. I was recently at a class at ASU and I asked 70 students, how many of you plan to be here in 10 years? Three hands went up. It is a smoke signal from the future. If we're going to sustain an economy where talent is the key driver, we must grow it, we must keep it, and we must recruit it. It is all about talent. So we must address the education crisis that faces us, the deep cuts that have occurred to both K-12 and higher education in Arizona, and the low performance of many of our schools. We must make long-term sustainable commitments to the industries of the future that are creating the products and ideas that the rest of the world will buy. We must create living spaces and uh, exciting urban energy, because that's what young talent is looking for. And we must recognize, and this may be more controversial, but we must recognize in the 21st century that talent comes white and black and brown and rainbow. And those states and those nations that create a welcome mat for talent in whatever form it comes will have a competitive advantage going forward. And finally, we must create an entrepreneurial environment where our students don't think about how to apply for their next job, but how to invent it. Number six, capital. I would urge that in a world where capital has so many choices where to deploy, policy sustainability is a critical component of return on investment for investors. Investors will take economic risk. That's what they understand. That's what they do. But they will walk away from political risk. And when we fund schools one year and defund them the next, when we fund TGen for four years and not the fifth, when we commit a five-year funding plan for Science Foundation Arizona and stop it, we are sending a message to the venture capital market that we are not serious about these commitments to the future industries of the 21st century. Seventh, democracy. The sustainability of democracy. We are watching, as we all know, a train wreck in Washington, D.C. It is a spectacle. And I would argue that the sustainability of democracy, our ability for rational self-governance, is a right target for a sustainability conference. After my friend Gabby Giffords was shot, I founded the Institute on Civil Discourse at the University of Arizona. And I've come to believe, particularly now that I've put my toe in political waters, that every single incentive, every single incentive embedded in our political system is weighted towards confrontation, vitriol, and partisanship. Press, media, money, voters, volunteers. Every single incentive is draws you away away from governance and towards confrontation. Solving problems in a two-party system requires compromise, and our political system punishes politicians for doing so. It is a non-sustainable democratic path. So our solution lies not in the stars, but in ourselves. After completing the Constitution, Ben Franklin walked out in front of Constitution Hall and was met by a, a, a lady and the lady asked him, Mr. Franklin, have you built us a republic or a democracy? Franklin said, a democracy, ma'am, if you can keep it. And I think that is the key sustainability question of our time. Thank
Thanks very much for your time. Sir.